Okay. Um, well, our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Jones. And Dr. Jones, can you please come forward? Dr. Jones is uh, an expert in history, as you, many of you probably well know. He's the editor of Culture Wars magazine. Yay! And <clears throat> Dr. Jones, without exaggeration, is another genius that I am happy to have the privilege of knowing. And he's going to talk to you today about Newton, Isaac Newton, and physics, and politics, and all kinds of things like that. So let's have a hand for Dr. Jones. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. My, my, uh, my good friend, Tony Trier, is sitting with him. He uh, said to me in the middle of the conference, he leaned over to me and he said, he said, why is this conference being held in South Bend, Indiana? And I looked at him and I said, because South Bend is the center of the universe. <laughs> Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about uh, Sir Isaac Newton, and uh, I'm going to talk about him in a context that I've been exploring lately, uh, namely his history and, and economics. Uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a, a, a new book. Uh, my last book was The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit. It was 1,200, thank you. It was 1,200 pages long. I hope manifested itself in the realm of economics. Anyway, to get back to our story here. In 1687, the Royal Society published Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica Philosophiae Naturae to almost universal acclaim. It went on to be an event that was compared with God creating the world. as when Pope wrote, God said, let Newton be and all was light. The publication of the Principia has been portrayed as a quasi-divine act ever since. And what was this divine accomplishment? Newton's Principia brought heaven and earth together in one unified system. He united celestial and terrestrial mechanics, the systems of Kepler and Galileo respectively, into one unified mathematical construct described by the inverse square law. Newton was a mathematician of genius, but he put mathematics to more than one use in the Principia. The first use was to describe the attraction which gravity exerted between bodies in general and the planets in particular. The second use of mathematics was to cover his tracks. Newton deliberately made the Principia as unreadable as possible by adding large sections of mathematical equations of his own invention. Newton's friend William Durham said, and this is a direct quote, and for this reason, namely to avoid being baited by little smatterers in mathematics, he told me, he designedly made his Principia abstruse. As a, as a qualified little smatterer in mathematics, I, I understand what he meant there. Admirers of the Principia have been in such awe of Newton's mathematical ability that they failed to see that the Principia aspired to be more than mathematics. It was a treatise in physics and mechanics, and it was a cosmology as well. And it was in these areas that the first objections to a system began to intrude upon the otherwise universal applause which greeted its birth. Newton claimed that the celestial motion of the planets could be explained by two laws. The first was inertia, by which Newton claimed that all bodies in motion would continue in motion until acted upon by another body. And this reversed the common sense Aristotelian notion of a universe in which most objects were at rest by claiming that rest was the exception and motion was the rule. Rule one was, however, only half the system because according to the law of inertia, bodies would continue in motion in straight lines leading to total dispersal of matter, energy, and end in chaos. 
What brought the universe into circular or perfect motion and created what we might call the solar system was gravity. Gravity was the universal force of attraction which held the universe together much as the string attached to the rock keeps it revolving around the head of the boy swinging it instead of that rock flying off into space. Newton concluded that the operation of gravity could be described mathematically by the inverse square law, but he could never explain either what gravity was or how it worked. Newton's readers on the continent, in particular Christian Huygens and Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, picked up this, on this immediately and accused Newton of covertly smuggling occult properties into a system. Huygens found the principle of attraction, quote, absurd, unquote. For, this, for, for his part, Leibniz was astonished that Newton had not proceeded to find the cause of the law of gravity by what, in what he meant an ethereal vortex, which would reduce attraction to a mechanical cause. Newton's physics was based on a rejection of Aristotle's idea of natural motion, which taught that the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, all had their natural place, and that bodies in which any one of these elements predominated would either go up, home of the natural abode of both fire and air, or down, the natural abode or home of both earth and water. Once each body reached its natural place, it would be at rest, a state which characterized most of the universe. The motion of a body away from its natural place of rest was known as violent motion. In place of Aristotle, Newton adopted the physics of Descartes, which divided the world into matter, the res extensa, and thought the res cogitans. The res extensa was all of one piece. The entire physical universe was one fabric or one fluid composed of atoms, and motion occurred when one atom bumped into another and conveyed to that second atom its motion in much the same way that a locomotive conveys motion to a string of boxcars. Leibniz and Huygens were smart enough to realize that in the Cartesian material universe, which Newton ostensibly espoused, there was no possibility of action at a distance, and that meant that there could be no such thing as gravity. White tells us that Leibniz, quote, was, was suspicious of Newton's entire concept of gravity, referring to it mockingly, and this is a quote from Leibniz, as the rebirth in England of a theology that, it has, that is more than papist and a philosophy entirely scholastic since Newton and his partisans have revived the occult qualities of the school with the idea of attraction. Well, Newton was no papist. Well, where then did the idea of gravity come from? Leibniz got it right when he claimed that Newton smuggled gravity into the system, but they got the source wrong. The source was a cult. It wasn't scholasticism. The real source was alchemy. Newton wasn't a closet, closet scholastic. Newton was an alchemist. Beginning in 1669, Newton devoted 10 years of his life all but exclusively to alchemical research, including experiments involving equipment in his Cambridge apartment. Newton devoted more of his life to alchemy than he did to mechanics or optics or even mathematics. The Principia was in many ways both the culmination of his alch alchemical studies and also a short interruption of those alchemical studies because he continued them afterwards as well. Alchemy was born in Alexandria in Egypt when Egyptian metal workers tried to find an explanation for their craft in Greek philosophy at some point around the time of the beginning of the Christian era. It was Egypt and Greece coming together in Alexandria. According to Hopkins, real alchemy did not exist until philosophy had been applied to explain the artistic creations of the workers in metals. Hopkins claims that Plato and Aristotle furnished the philosophy from which alchemy arose but before long, it becomes clear that both Plato and Aristotle derived their ideas from Empedocles. If you read the Timaeus, which is the only book of Plato that was well known during the Middle Ages, Plato says explicitly uh, that Empedocles had attempted to explain the composition of all natural objects as being made up of four units, earth, water, air, and fire. 
Plato, Plato may have understood the concept dis differently, but that's where he got the idea. Aristotle had a more sophisticated understanding of uh, matter than the atomists. He believed that the world was made up of, uh, instead of being made up of little balls bumping into each other, Aristotle believed that as forms are to matter, so also the soul is to the body. The form was the entelechy, or the telos embedded in the object, the telos of the object. Aristotle nonetheless paved the way for alchemy when in explaining the four elements of Empedocles, he wrote, there is nothing strange in supposing that brass may lose some of its elementary earth and partake more of the higher elements such as fire. By changing to higher qualities, brass may be changed into gold, for the quality of gold is independent of the metallic substances, which is its support. Now, Newton was familiar with Empedocles both through his alchemical research and through his exposure to classical thought at Cambridge University, where he was both an undergraduate and holder of the Lucasian Chair of Mathematics. In one of his unpublished papers, Newton wrote that Empedocles claimed that all matter consist of atoms, an idea which he claims was a very ancient opinion and one which is usually associated with Democritus. Now, atomism held a peculiar attraction for Newton, and that's something we're going to talk about a little bit later. But the idea was common enough, and he could have gotten it from any number of sources. The idea most is usually associated with Empedocles, though, and the one which alchemy adopted as its metaphysical first principle was that the idea was the idea that the universe was kept in motion by the contradictory forces of love and strife. Now, do love and strife sound familiar now that you have already explained the first principles of the Newtonian system? Well, the first principles are Empedocles, love, and strife. So in other words, the first principle of the Newtonian system is inertia, and that is the same as strife. And the second principle of the Newtonian system is gravity or attraction, and that is the same as love. And so what we have is Mars and Venus. And you put Mars and Venus together, and you get circular you get copulation, and you get circular motion and eternal motion, okay? This is the Newtonian system in a nutshell. Both Huygens and Leibniz were correct in claiming that Newton's cosmology was based on occult forces, but both erred in thinking that he derived these forces from scholasticism. Their source was older than that. It was Empedocles, and Newton most probably learned about Empedocles via alchemy. Alchemy was full of mythological forces, attractions and repulsions, or as Newton would say, sociableness and unsociableness. Venus, which was both a planet and the metal copper, would fall in love or find itself irresistibly attracted to Mercury, which still retains its identity both as a planet and a metal in common parlance. And then copulation would result bringing about a new compound. It's a bit like saying that sodium is so attracted to chlorine that the two fell in love, copulated, and produced table salt. Newton was very specific in dealing with talking this way. And this, so he has one of his many alchemical papers, he says, basically, dissolve volatile green lion in the central salt of Venus and distill. This spirit is the green lion, the blood of the green lion, Venus, the Babylonian dragon that kills everything with its poison, but conquered by being assuaged by the doves of Diana. It is the bond of Mercury. Neptune, with his trident, leads the philosopher into the Sophic garden. Therefore, Neptune is the minerally, mineral watery menstruum and the trident is the ferment of water similar to the caduceus of mercury with which mercury is fermented. That is the two dry doves with the dry martial Venus. You got that or should I repeat it? <laughs> what we see in Newton is not a return to scholasticism but a return to paganism. The Newtonian system gave new life to the English ideology 
but the English ideology had always been involved in magic. In fact, there is a direct line of intellectual influence connecting Newton to Robert Boyle, from Boyle back to Samuel Hartlib, from Samuel Hartlib back to Robert Flood, from Robert Flood back to Francis Bacon, and from Francis Bacon back to John Dee, who began the alchemical tradition in England at the time of the Reformation. Now, I am talking about the center point here, the kind of mechanism of Newton. If you want to know about the alchemical tradition from John Dee up to Newton, it's in the Jewish revolutionary spirit. If you want to jump ahead from Newton and understand how the Whig junta, the Whig revolutionaries, took Newton and turned it into a weapon that was spread by Masonic agents, uh, uh, Masonic lodges to bring down the Bourbon House, in, in France, that's in the Jewish revolutionary spirit too, under the chapter of Freemasonry. What Newton did is he refined Dee's magic down to its two, magic, two basic principles, love and strife. And of the two, strife or inertia was the more basic. That is the first principle, strife. The notion that strife is the fundamental principle of the universe would become a fundamental belief of the English ideology. If we substitute the more economic term competition for strife, we can see that Newton established the fundamental principles for modern English capitalism as well. According to Adam Smith's reading, greed or self-love, which is analogous to each body in space seeking its own good without regard to any other body, is held in check by competition, and the result is Smith's version of perfect motion, otherwise known as the invisible hand which assures that private vice is transformed magically or alchemically, we would say, into public good. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution is another example of the English ideology, also derived from Newton, and Darwin also claims that strife, or as he would say, natural selection, is the fundamental principle of the universe. Darwin, like Newton, frames no hypotheses. He looks at nature and discovers strife is its fundamental law. Now, that things may not be that simple is demonstrated more by Harvard professor Eric D. Beinhalker than I could do myself. In his book called The Origin of Wealth, which you probably picked up, is a combination of the origin of the species and uh, the wealth of nations, so you know where this guy's coming from. No Irish Catholic he. <laughs> he tells us, evolutionary theory and economics have a long and intertwined history. In fact, it was an economist, lo and behold, it was an economist who helped spark one of Charles Darwin's most important insights. In 1798, an English economist, Thomas Robert Malthus, published a book entitled An Essay on the Principle of Population as it Affects Future Improvements of Society in which he portrayed the economy as a competitive struggle for survival and a constant race between populations, growth, and humankind's ability to improve its productivity. It was a race that Malthus predicted humankind would lose. Now, lo and behold, guess what? Darwin read Malthus's book and described his reaction in his autobiography. In October 1838, that is 15 months, this is Darwin speaking now, I began my systematic inquiry. I happened to read, for my amusement, Walthus on population, and being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence which everywhere goes on from long continued observation of habits of animals and plants. It once struck me that under these circumstances, favorable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones would be destroyed. The result would be the formation of a new species here then, you can hear him almost saying Eureka, here then I had at last got the theory by which to work. End of quote from Darwin. Now, I, people were talking about Occam's razor. Let's apply Occam's razor here, okay? Evolution is really just a rationalization of English capitalism. Darwin got the idea of evolution by reading a justification for English capitalism. So economics is really just evolutionary biology, or is biology really just, just capitalist economics? Professor Beinhocker puts on his thinking cap, and he thinks real hard for a while, and then he says, comes up, 
His explanation for this coincidence is not that minds, great minds run in the same circles. No, his explanation is that evolution is an algorithm. In fact, evolution is a universal algorithm. In fact, evolution is the fundamental algorithm of the universe. So therefore, it should come to no, as no surprise that biology and economics should obey the same laws, or as he puts it, quote, the same process that has driven the growing order and complexity of the biosphere has driven the growing order and complexity of the oconosphere. Well, wait a minute. No, you got it backwards. Saying that, he, or he, he tries again here, okay? Saying that economic systems are like biological systems does not tell us much that is scientifically useful. But saying that both economic and biological systems are subclasses of a more general and universal class of evolutionary systems tells us a lot. This is because researchers believe that there are general laws of evolutionary systems. Science, scientists consider certain features of nature universal. And then he goes on to talk about gravity and blah, 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 blah. And evolution will follow certain general laws in its behavior. Now. What are these fundamental laws common to both Darwin and Newton and economics? Have you figured that out yet? These laws are, you guessed it, love and strife. But when it comes to Darwin, it's mostly strife. Professor Mirovsky, in his brilliant book, More Heat Than Light, has shown convincingly that economics is in reality bad physics and that the science of economics is ultimately traceable back to Newton, or at least his system as it stopped developing around 1850. So basically what economists do is they say, let's pretend that physicists know what they're talking about, and then we'll base our economic system on that fiction. Even if he does so unintentionally, Professor Beinhocker takes Professor Mirovsky's insight to a whole new level by showing, again, unintentionally that evolution, survival of the fittest, and natural selection are really nothing but a rationalization of English capitalism projected back on the natural world as a way of exculpating its perpetrators of the guilt they incur by imposing this system on the rest of us. Taking Professor Beinhocker's and Professor Mirovsky's insights to still another level, I would propose that just as classic economics is nothing more than bad physics, so classical physics of the sort by, proposed by Newton is nothing more than bad economics. And by bad, I use the word as implying both moral fault and intellectual defect. Just as Darwin and Malthus projected the English capitalism of their day onto the world of biology, so Newton projected the capitalism of his day onto the universe when he said that its most pr fundamental principle was inertia or strife. That is not in the inverse square law. You probably figured that out by now. But in order to prove my point, I have to resituate Newtonian physics in the context of its times. The Principia was posed, composed during a period of great political turmoil. Newton, who was a committed Puritan revolutionary, began work on the Principia in 1685. In February of that year, Charles II died and was succeeded by his brother James II. James was a Catholic, and with his accession to the throne, England was gripped by fears that his brother would attempt to convert the country into a Catholic state. Newton, we are told, was horrified by that prospect. When the galleys of the Principia were still at the press, Newton became embroiled in university politics when he imposed James' order to admit a Benedictine priest by the name of Alban Francis to the degree of Master of Arts without exercises and without oaths. oaths sorry. When the university provost bungled the appeal, Newton was chosen as one of two representatives to convey to the vice chancellor their voluntary advice that it would be illegal and unsafe to admit Father Francis to the degree. Westfall claims that Newton spoke out and articulated the common fears when prudentials left others mute. His principles were clear enough. A mixture, he wrote, of papist and Protestant in the same university can neither subsist happily nor long together. 
One year later, in November of 1688, William of Orange landed at the head of a 600-ship armada at Torbay, and James, the rightful sovereign, was forced to flee from London, and a few days later was allowed to slip in, away by sea into exile. Newton, who was an extreme Whig, now found himself on the winning side of the glorious revolution. Within months of the revolution, he was elected to parliament as the representative of Cambridge University. Two days after being elected to parliament, Newton dined with the king. The retiring professor was now a political player. In 1689, Newton met with the political philosopher John Locke for the first time. Newton, Locke attempted to read the Principia while still in exile, but being uh, what Newton would call a little smatterer in mathematics, he couldn't figure out what it was about, and had to turn to his friend Christian Huygens, who assured him that math, uh, Newton's mathematics were in order. In 1692, Locke traveled to Cambridge, where he and Newton took some red earth bequeathed them by the alchemist and, and uh, uh, Robert Boyle, and tried to transmute it in Newton's laboratory into the philosopher's stone. Now think about that for a moment. The two pillars of the English Enlightenment huddled in Newton's laboratory trying to create the philosopher's stone out of, out of a pile of red dirt that they had gotten from Robert Boyle. Newton was the Harry Potter of his day. <laughs> Locke mentioned Newton glowingly in the introduction to his essay concerning human understanding. He obviously saw in Newton a valuable asset for the Whig cause. And what did the Whigs need most at this point when the revolution was still young and vulnerable? What did Locke see in Newton? In addition to a man who could turn lead into gold, which is always a useful skill, Locke saw in Newton's Principio a new source of credibility or legitimacy, the one thing the Whig revolutionaries lacked when they placed a usurper on the throne. Newton's cosmology was rationalization in just about every sense of the word, and it was rationalization of the, word, of the term force. Motion was redefined in the Principia. It no longer bespoke a telos or goal as it had in the Aristotelian system. Motion was now extrinsic to the bodies in motion, and that extrinsic mo the cause of that extrinsic motion was force. Once Whig magnates digested the lesson of the Principia with the help of propagandists like Locke, they learned that all motion was caused not by an entelechy, in other words, bodies having a proper end coming to their fulfillment as pupils learning, which is another for example of motion in the Aristotelian system. Uh, but only external force, which was in some sense of the word totally arbitrary and much in that sense much like the force which put James II in motion and drove him from his rightful position, which was now associated with the outmoded context, a concept of entelechy or telos, and that rightful position was the throne of England. So according to the Whig physics now, there is no rightful motion, there is no legitimate heir, the only person residing on the throne is the person who has enough force to get there, or force the other body out of the, out of the way, and that's the end of the story. There was no longer any proper end to motion. Every motion was arbitrary and a function of force. All motion was, in the Aristotelian sense, violent motion. And all of it was determined by force, which is always imposed from without. No legitimacy, force, end of story. Newton's Principia was, in other words, a usurper's dream. And that is why the Whig junta fastened on it as an answer to a maiden's prayer. Newton's Principia gave mathematical and therefore scientific legitimacy to the world that Shakespeare had described in the wake of the Protestant takeover of England and the looting of church property that constituted the first stage of capital formation in the history of English capitalism. And I'm talking about Ulysses' speech, the Ulysses' famous speech in Troilus and Cressida, which is Newtonian physics without the math. Take but degree away, 
and substitute telos here for degree. Take but degree away, untune that string, and hark what discord follows. Each thing meets in mere oppugnancy or strife. Everything is now based on strife or competition or natural selection or survival of the fittest. The bounded waters should lift up their bosoms higher than the shores and make a sop of all this solid globe. Strength should be the lord of imbecility, and the rude son should strike his father dead. Force. Force. And here we're getting to the heart of the Newtonian cosmology. Force should be right, or rather right and wrong, between whose endless jar justice resides whose endless jar, that's all those atoms bumping into each other. Between whose endless jar justice resides should lose their name and so should justice too. Then everything includes itself in power, force again, power into will, will into appetite, and appetite, a universal wolf, should doubly second with will and power must make perforce a universal prey and at last eat itself up. That, in a nutshell, is the description of the brave new world imposed on England by the glorious revolution. And that, in a nutshell, is a summary of the operating system of that regime, which has soon come to be known as capitalism. Capitalism is government-sponsored usury and usury, like the universal wolf, invariably eats itself up when the debt burden becomes insurmountable and the economy freezes up under it, as happened in 2008 and 1929 and too many times previous to recount here. It's the same story. Newton got the idea for inertia and gravity from alchemy, which got the ideas of love and strife from Empedocles, but he got his idea of force from the lived experience of English capitalism. All the lessons Newton learned as a child were economic. Newton's father died when he was a small child. When he was three years old, his mother married a 63-year-old widower who happened also to be an Anglican priest out of purely financial considerations. She thought the old guy was going to die any moment, and she would inherit all of his, pro his property. As part of the prenuptial agreement, Newton's mother had to agree to leave three-year-old Isaac behind to be raised by his grandparents. The Reverend Smith lived longer than Hannah expected. When she finally moved back to live with Isaac, she brought three half-siblings with her, and the bond between mother and child was irrevocably broken and Isaac had been permanently scarred by the experience. The universe was a different place now. It was ruled by unseen forces that moved bodies in inexplicable ways, ways that a child of undeniable genius would attempt to explain in later life. Westfall, one of the best biographers, claims, Newton was a tortured man, an extremely neurotic personality, who teetered always, at least through middle age, on the verge of breakdown. No one has to stretch credulity excessively to believe that the second marriage and departure of his mother should have contributed enormously to the inner torment of that boy, already perhaps bewildered by the realization that he, like, unlike others, had no father. White is even more specific and more censorious. He calls Hannah Ascoff Newton Smith, Newton's, uh, Isaac's mother, calls her abandonment of her three-year-old son totally heartless and goes on to say, quote, the enforced separation from his mother at such an impressionable age has long been recognized as one of the key factors in shaping his character, close quote. Now, if this trauma shaped Newton's character, then it shaped the intellectual system that was the product of that character as well. Deprived of a mother's love and a father's guidance, Isaac could meditate upon the principles which his mother's sudden departure taught him through his lonely and unhappy childhood. The first and most unmistakable conclusion that he de deduced from his mother's abandoning him when he was three is that all human beings are atoms which proceed through life alone and at the mercy of impersonal forces. 
Newton's enforced separation from his mother, who chose money over the welfare of her only child, became not only the basis for Newton's character, as White indicates, but the basis for his future physics as well. Both derived their character from the economic lessons Newton learned as a three-year-old who was abandoned by his mother. Newton early on constructed a theory of economic forces which would have direct relevance to his cosmological theory. Newton's real first law, which is to say he want, the one he learned from his mother, states that money, which is always translatable as force, is more important than the bond between a mother and her child. A mother's love, as well as the most intimate and familiar ties, are controlled by abstract economic principles which no child can understand and which remain mysterious to the great majority of mankind. The heart of this economics is the idea of force, which, as Professor Murawski has explained, is another word for money. Economic force or money alone explains the motion of heavenly bodies like that of his mother. Money is the secret force that determines motion. There is no planum or fullness to nature. There are only lonely atoms in a void moved by force, which is another word for money. As Westfall tells us, after deploying the standard arguments against a planum, Newton opted for atoms, which is to say a cosmology based on his life as an abandoned child and a lonely scholar. Like Darwin, Newton projected English capitalism onto the universe. Unlike Darwin, the pampered scion of the English ruling class, Newton projected capitalism as he saw it and lived it, the rejected outcast who was determined to make his way by political patronage or force. The ultimate source of Newton's cosmology wasn't mathematics. It wasn't disinterested observation eschewing hypotheses as the famous phrase, hypothesi non fingo, indicated. It wasn't even alchemy from which he derived the concepts of inertia and gravity. The ultimate source of Newton's cosmology was capitalism, viewed through the lens of his relationship with his mother. Subsequent experience only reinforced the view of the universe he learned from his absent mother. By the time Newton enrolled at Cambridge, his mother was earning 700 pounds a year at a time when a skilled craftsman or average civil servant had to make do on 50. And yet Newton had to earn his room and board and tuition there as a sizer, which is to say a servant who waited on tables and emptied the chamber pots of those better off than he. It was a situation which further poisoned his relations with his mother. The injustice of the economic situation led to thoughts of violence. He spoke of it in his diary. He spoke of in his diary of burning his, his mother and father's step house, mother and stepfather's house down with them in it. Newton was fascinated by the idea of perpetual motion. He consoled himself by constructing machines. And uh, like Hook, he, uh, he was influenced by that form of the universe. What he did ultimately was create, turn the universe into the ultimate machine, and he found perpetual motion in the realm of finance before he found it in the realm of physics. Finding it impossible to get along with his fellow students, Newton decided to, find, to exploit them financially instead by engaging, quote, and this is Westfall's quote, in extensive business in usury, conducted largely among fellow sizers. Newton would continue to be a money lender for his entire life. In 1693, Newton experienced what seems to have been a mental breakdown. This is after the publication of the Principia, after he has been fastened on as the great white hope for the, uh, the Whig uh, junta. In a manic and rambling letter, he accused Locke of wanting to embroil me with women. Explanations for the breakdown range from mercury poisoning. This man had uh, stills with mercury in them bu bubbling away 24 hours a day in the same apartment where he was. So the explanations range from mercury poisoning to the end of his relationship with Fatio de Dullier, with whom he is suspected of having uh, homosexual relations. I suspect it may have had to do more with his experiments in alchemy. 
In particular, in the passage in the Praxis, this is one of his alchemical papers, he wrote, you may multiply gold in quantity by the mercuries of which you made it, first amalgamating the stone with the mercury of three or more eagles and adding their weight of the water. And if you design it for metals, you may melt three times parts of gold with one of the stone or the philosopher's stone. Every multiplication will increase its virtue 10 times. And if you use the mercury of the second or third rotation with the spirit, perhaps a thousand times. Thus, you may multiply it to infinity. This is Newton in his manic phase. In, 19, in, in 1693, he realized that you could not multiply gold to the infinity as he had hoped in his alchemical treaties. That's when he went into a state of depression. And then what pulled him out of the state of depression was the fact that his economic, his situation, the entire situation changed. It changed because the political climate changed. With the election of 1694, the Whigs were swept into government, and then Newton's friend Charles Montague was appointed chancellor of the Exchequer. At this point, Newton made one of the most, uh, in general, mystifying uh, changes of his career when he went from being the professor, the, uh, the uh, disconnected professor of physics, the godlike Newton, to taking a government patronage job when he became warden of the mint. Now, nobody can seem to explain this. It's just one of these mysteries about uh, Newton's life. But what I'm saying here, if you know that he was an alchemist, it's not hard to understand that the transition was kind of natural, especially when the Whigs saw what he was in, involved in. It's also easy to understand because 1696, which was the year when he became uh, head of the warden, uh, the warden of the mint, was a year of financial crisis for the glorious revolution. The war had placed financial demands far beyond any precedent on the state, and in 1696 it was not clear that those demands were met. If they were not, national bankruptcy would have ensued and the revolutionary settlement would undoubtedly have collapsed before a Stuart restoration. The monetary crisis which bedeviled the financial crisis by reaching a climax when it could least be tolerated occupied Newton for almost, for more than two years of his life. The fact of the matter was that uh, England had debased its coinage mercilessly from the time of the uh, Protestant Reformation to the point where there were all sorts of people making money, clipping the edges of coins and counterfeiting coins, and the Whig uh, 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 government simply could not uh, the currency was debased to the point where it was worthless. And so foreign currencies were only accepting uh, discounted versions of English coins because it was so bad. At this point, uh, they decided that they had to recoin. And in a sense, Newton was the logical um, choice for this because he was an alchemist. And one of the jobs that alchemists had during the Middle Ages was working as uh, in mints. And one of, the one of the reasons they had their reputation for being able to multiply gold was because they were making gold coins. And you can multiply gold if you debase it with tin. So if you put the, your gold coin is suddenly half, only half 50% gold, you have doubled the amount of gold. Anyway, this is the situation. Newton starts studying economics, and then early in March, of 1696, he receives a mysterious visitor. He received a visit from a Londoner acquainted with Mr. Boyle, who was the alchemist, Robert Boyle, the chemist, and Mr. Dickinson, who discoursed with him for two days on the work according to Yodokus Array, an early 17th century alchemist whom Newton had studied. Every indication in Newton's account of the visit suggests that the man knew exactly whom he was looking for when he came to Cambridge. And as for Newton, he composed two drafts of a memorandum recording the conversation. Two weeks later, after being vetted by the mysterious stranger, Newton got the job. Judging from subsequent events, the interview had to do with Newton's monetary policy, which he was going to be involved in the recoinage that was going to save the Whig Revolution. Most probably, this conversation involved Newton's willingness to debase the currency. 
The reason I say this is because it came up for debate, and the Secretary of the Treasury at felt that the only way to save the Whig regime was to devalue the currency. Newton, and I'm quoting Westall here, was one of the few who agreed with Lowndes' plan to devalue. Newton rationalized the whole thing by saying prices would rise an equivalent amount, but strict government controls exercised through the livery companies in London could protect the inflation. He was willing to let rents rise so that landlords would not suffer permanent loss. Holders of government annuities would suffer loss, but he assumed that the parliament would assuage their lot to maintain the government's credit. Locke was the most articulate of those who insisted that only the recoinage at the old standard could salvage the currency. Eventually, it was Locke's view that prevailed, and Newton was ordered to create an honest currency. His patron, Charles Montague, met the financial needs of the Whig regime with the newly created Bank of England, which funded the national debt instead of creating a debased currency. And capitalism was launched in earnest onto a world where it would cause even more misery than the amateurist attempts at usury that it had caused in the Middle Ages. And what Newton learned is that physics was more serviceable than he suspected but more importantly that, than that, he learned that the dream of alchemy, which he thought had died during the black year of 1693, hadn't died after all. It had been reborn as the quintessence of the English ideology. He and Locke had actually found their philosopher's stone in the world of capitalist finance. Thank you very much.